everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about the Nair of India. I'm not an expert on this culture, and it's been decades since I've studied cultural anthropology. It's fair to say I'm not an expert on any culture, except maybe the one I'm immersed in as a member. My goal with this discussion is not to make you an expert on anything. It's not to do a deep dive. It's to take a look at some distinctions that help us better check our biases that manifest in mild forms of xenophobia. I hope in some ways these discussions will raise some awareness about assumptions we make about human nature that are really culturally, not biologically derived. In other words, which manifestations of our existence are inherent and which are culturally derived. It's not always easy or even possible to know, but sometimes what we see as a difference between cultures can give us a clue. The Nayar exist within the caste system of India and actually represent a number of groups and castes on the southwestern Malabar coast. Historically, they were a fairly prominent social class with origins that may have been tied to military or warrior status. Their actual origins are disputed, but their customs are distinct from many of those found in other cultures around the region. What was interesting about them to me was their family structure. To begin with, they're matrilineal. They owned family estates jointly, and ownership belonged to the siblings, the brothers and sisters, and the sister's children, and her daughter's children. So the heritable property was passed down through the women in the family. The family groups were communal and generally consisted of between 50 to 80 members. Despite the matrilineal lines, the head of the house was the oldest male relative, but authority in the family units was not wielded by husbands, but by brothers of the mothers. As far as marriage, the women at a young age would be ritually married to a man generally within her own caste. The marriage was symbolic, and the society had no expectations around the relationship. The couple was not expected to have sex or cohabit, and children were not expected out of these unions. When the girls became young women, post-puberty, they were free to have sexual relationships with as many men as they liked. These men were called visiting husbands, and were usually from a more prominent caste than her own. Nayar men were similarly free to express their sexuality with women from appropriate castes. In addition to this, any party to these relationships was free to end them for any reason at all, or for no reason. Cause was not required, and the relationships could be concurrent. Interestingly, there's been some dispute about whether to allow that marriage existed at all among the Nayar, and I wonder if that isn't a bias about what marriage means in the West. Any children born out of these relationships were considered to belong exclusively to the mother and her matrilineal group. In the 1930s, their customs and traditions were culturally assimilated into Western family models of monogamy and fatherhood and by the 1960s, almost none of the traditional customs remained intact. Some anthropologists have dedicated themselves to trying to sort out fact from fiction, which can be difficult due to cultural bias inherent in the accounts. But when the labeling is stripped away, what we're left with are matrilineal families where people were sexually free, children were considered progeny of their mother's family, and some foundations of Western relationship and family models were very challenged. I remember being at a conference once where a comedian did a skit that included a bit about a conversation she had with her fiancé about the idea of an open marriage. I can't recall the specifics of the joke, but it involved her seeing him at his funeral shortly after the wedding. The implication was that she'd kill him if he slept with other women after they were married. No one in the audience was horrified. In fact, it got a lot of laughs. This is because in our culture, the idea of a partner exerting sexual control is normalized. We have an expectation that being in a relationship requires not just monogamy, but exclusivity. If I were to tell my partner that they can't see family or have friendships anymore after we're married, 
that would generally be considered a red flag of an overly controlling and jealous partner. But if I insist they no longer have other sexual partners, this is generally considered to be reasonable. When I was studying anthropology, this attitude was generally associated with concepts of biological paternity and heritable wealth. The idea was that a person who gives birth in a traditional manner knows the baby they birthed is theirs. However, until recently, we lack the technology to confirm paternity, and even now that we have it, we rarely use it except in cases of disputed rights or obligations to a child. In the case of the Nayar, where wealth remains in the mother's family, and where paternity is not tied to a biological father, but again to the mother's male relatives, there is no need to control the sexuality of women in that culture. The men she is sleeping with are not considered to be tied to the resulting children, they aren't obligated to care for the children, and they aren't afforded any rights simply due to whatever biological material they may have contributed. So what about this comic at the conference? Don't misunderstand me. I know it's part of a comic routine. It's just a joke. But it plays on cultural attitudes about relationships that are tied to things that too many people think are inherent human conditions rather than social or cultural structures. It's a jest, for sure, intended as lighthearted. But let's think for a moment about the sorts of things that actually occur in the West when strict sexual exclusivity is not observed. When I was younger, there was something called a crime of passion. It was a form of defense, usually tied to violent or deadly crimes, where our laws suggested that even a reasonable person would be driven to outrage to such a degree that they might do something rash. It was most often tied to sexual infidelity when it was discussed. The issue was that discovering my partner is freely exercising their sexuality with another partner of their choosing was enough to drive me into a murderous rage. This was common thinking when I was a kid. As an adult, I'm glad we've moved away from that somewhat. And I think I can say with confidence that the people who laughed at that joke during the conference would not find it funny if someone really did murder their partner over an infidelity. Many people laughed because they related to the sentiment, but few would ever think it's acceptable as anything more than hyperbole today. But the outcomes of infidelity in our culture are really no joke when you begin to examine what actually can still happen when someone exercises their sexual agency within a monogamous relationship. Many people have been divorced or gone through bitter custody battles over anger over affairs or infidelity. People are emotionally hurt by these relationships to the point that some find it impossible to get past the idea that their partner had sex with someone else. These relationships reflect thoughts of betrayal and dishonesty. The irony being that the dishonesty is a built-in catch-22 where people lie in order to avoid the devastation that our society encourages as a result of people sexually expressing themselves and owning their own sexuality. Our society holds that your partner owns your sexuality, not you. However, it's an odd one-sided ownership. If my partner pressures me not to have sex with others, I'm expected to accept that as reasonable. But if my partner pressures me to have sex with someone else, let's say they have a voyeuristic desire, our culture would consider that unacceptable. So it's more about restricting sexual activity, about enforcing a form of sexual austerity, rather than real control. How would our Western attitudes about jealousy, monogamy, and exclusivity work in the Nayar culture? The short answer is, they wouldn't. What we consider normal, reasonable, expected behavior with regard to human relationships and sexuality would not work at all if we move those same assumptions into Nair culture. And what about paternity? Look at everything we have tied into biological paternity in our society, from legal requirements around financial and resource support from a father to a provision to exercise rights over progeny based on the results of a DNA test, because we have decided, as a culture, that contributing chromosomes to the production of a child affords someone rights and obligates them to provide resources. 
and few people question this model. We tend to just assume that genetic material is sufficient cause to tie a father to a child. And we don't really understand that this is an arbitrary social and cultural choice we've made that could have been decided differently. That we could set up other systems just as valid for child rearing in family structures. I'm not saying our cultural choices are bad or wrong. But I'm also not saying they're good and right. I'm saying they are cultural and social choices. And the more aware people are that these attitudes about sexual restrictions, marriage types, and even family structures are not inherent human attributes, but cultural constructs, the better we can be at identifying our own biases and mild xenophobic reactions and responses when we encounter something different. I remember when I made the decision to open my marriage. I went on to dating sites, and one thing I remember seeing that surprised me were how many of my married friends were already there. I was surprised because none of them had ever confided to me that their marriages were open. But part of that is the stigma that comes from simple relationships where people are welcomed and encouraged to explore their sexuality and own their own bodies and sexual expression. The idea of respecting a partner's agency, including their sexual agency, is so controversial in the U.S. to this day that people still don't feel entirely comfortable talking about it openly in mixed groups. And the assumption is still that marriage means exclusivity. It's even contained in many wedding vows that are still in use today. In a very literal way, the Nayar attitudes and social structures applied in the West are taboo and destructive, but not any more so than our own attitudes and structures were to their culture, And in fact, when our cultures clashed, it destroyed their traditions that had served their society well for countless centuries, living side by side with other cultures with different attitudes. The more Western expansion assimilates these societies, the more we see them disappear. The less we see that we have options, and the more likely we are to make erroneous assumptions about the nature of human behavior based on cultural models that are becoming more exclusive, not because they're better, but only because they're dominant. If I offer you two sandwiches, bologna or a PBJ, which will you choose? Very few people will choose the meatball sub, because it wasn't offered. If I don't tell people it's a choice, most people will go for whatever is in front of them. If I don't know what my options are, then I'm less likely to find and choose them. Again, this talk is not about the Nayar culture so much as helping us to see the biases in our own thinking. If you like learning about other cultures and want to do more research on your own, I'm including a few high-level resources to get you started in the description. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.